we made this. Welcome to the Starlight Ballroom. Hey. Welcome to Shipwrecked and Comatose, the podcast about Red Dwarf here on the We Made This Podcast Network. My name is Mark Adams and I'm your host today because we're doing five episodes in a week because we're fucking ridiculous and we're doing this magazines. Didn't we say ten in a row yesterday? <laughs> we said nine in a row but I lost the will to live so we're going to do the final four next year. <laughs> Prolong the pain. Prolong the pain. I did think about like re-recording the intro for the last episode, but that'd be kind of funny now that you've done that. That's Colin, by the way. Hello, Hello. Colin. (laughs) Carl's here as well. He was the one who did the little dance you couldn't see while he sang a song. Hello, Carl. Hello. (laughs) I really enjoy podcasting with you. I just don't like the research for this magazine episodes. It's really hard. (laughs) (laughs) Like, effort. Don't have to just watch a telly program. You have to actually put like actual hours in. So yeah, we've noted out. We're only doing five. We said nine, but we're not. We're doing five, and we'll do four more next year because it's our podcast, damn it. And five episodes in a week is still dead good and committed. And okay, there are other podcasts that are as committed as us that red do red talk, but not the point. We're committed and care and stuff and things. Volume two, issue two. I haven't written down when it was released. June 1993. Fuck. Technically, end of May 1993 is when it came out, but it's the June yeah. issue. We have had that conversation quite a lot of times, so we don't need it. Uh, the cover features a photograph of Rimmer, and he's got an odd face, and it says, Why is he such a git? I'm glad I've read this one because I might, I actually read the, the next one <laughs> earlier on today. <laughs> oh dear. I knew I should have checked. But I have read this one, so we're fine. It also says Future Echoes is the most important episode and does an interview with Claire Grogan. There is a question mark on that. It says, We look at Future Echoes, the most important Red Dwarf episode ever. Perhaps. I mean, maybe it was at that point because, you know, Gunman of the Apocalypse hadn't happened. <laughs> True. <laughs> it also says there's some postcards. Did you, either of you have this? Did either of you get postcards? No, this was after I stopped getting it. I did get it. Uh, I trying desperately to remember what the postcards were. I believed a lot of them were like planet shots of uh, like Starbug and Red Dwarf on various planets. Almost like, you know, you know, greetings from Titan, that kind of thing. Yeah, so... Uh, oh, that's cool. Rather than just another picture of Crichton and another picture of Cat and... Yeah. There probably was one of those as well, because they, they do love yeah. to use their uh, random pictures of castmates that they've got. Yeah. So, this Megatorial is... It's more of a blurb in a kind of buy this magazine, and um, it's a shit contents page. Uh, well, it's not rest. a contents page at all, because there is no contents whatsoever. No. There is yeah. a T-shirt competition for some of the shittest looking T-shirts I have ever seen. Yeah, for like American T-shirts. So in theory, imported T-shirts is a really, really cool prize, particularly in 1993. Yeah. But they were shit. Yeah. yeah. I'm just double checking here. Do, do they have the thing that I re- remember a lot from these kind of things when I was a kid, which is uh, wait 28 days for delivery? No, no, it doesn't. But I do remember if you ever ordered anything from America, <laughs> it was going to take a month. Yeah. What it actually says, instead of wait 28 days for delivery, is we'll let you know who's won a bit after the closing date above, okay. <laughs> Which I, I like the casualness of that. <laughs> they don't want to commit to anything because they know how things have gone in previous issues. <laughs> Probably. Um, the question, I didn't understand it and I certainly couldn't answer it. I know the answer. What was the question? So the question was... <laughs> We'll give them away to people who can tell us what network's company name was when they started making and selling Red Dwarf t-shirts in this country. So the the Red Dwarf mail order t-shirts that they have an advert for in every issue, the company is called uh, Network, but it was previously called BMS, which I found out by looking in one of the earliest magazines. Right, okay. I didn't just know that. 
It does pay off then the uh, having read the previous ones that we could win these exclusive, if crap looking. Uh, apart from the one of Rimmer in full Demon and Angels Dom gear, <laughs> that would have been a fun one. I couldn't work out what that who that was. It's it's basically saying we'll give this away to somebody who's got an earliest magazine to check. Mm. Yeah. Odd. Odd question. Okay, so first up is List of the God Part 2. And this is a Cat Wars history followed by, like, some crazy ass on the ship. Yeah. And I loved it. Yeah. Another Nigel Kitching strip with brilliant artwork, as all of them are. I really, really like this. The bit that I wasn't as sure about, there's a bit where towards the end of it, they're sort of hiding behind a door and the crazed cat warrior is about to uh, sort of hack his way through. Lister and one of the goody cat people hide behind a door and then Lister says, but if he smashes through the door and says, Johnny's home, all bets are off. Which made me think, is that... Because it was in 1993 and it wasn't as easy to check the film quote from The Shining, because here's Johnny, obviously, is the quote, not Johnny's home. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it's really jarring because it's really obviously wrong. But then, mm. obviously, these days you're... It can't be a copyright issue, no, surely. No, definitely not a copyright issue. But, yeah, these days... Any quote like that you hear repeated all of the time because of the internet, which obviously back mm. then you didn't. So people probably did get things wrong more often, but didn't realise because nobody noticed. Or it could be that they're portraying Lister as thick. No, because it's the joke. The joke would make more sense if he said it correctly. I like the um, mm. the thing that's been established here that there's a 2000, uh, because obviously in the books and in the earlier episodes they talk about it's all about the blue and red hats for the hot dog stall and this and the other but in this one it's half of them believe it the god's name is cloister and half of them believe it's clister and the elite of the cat world decide to just board themselves up in a tower and see who wins basically it's oddly political it's more of an adult one uh, this one i think than than some of the previous ones we've had it's very on brand to be satirical about Um, religion again The religions are depicted as utterly, utterly ludicrous. And I think that's generally what they like to do and suggest that religion is ludicrous. In a lot of cases, definitely it can be. (laughs) I've not read the next one yet. I'm looking forward to reading it because I was really quite intrigued by the cliffhanger on the end of this where Hudson turns up. A deep cut that I was all for it and I wasn't expecting it. And I was like, holy yeah. shit. It's kind of like a everything gets worse crossover. Yeah. It's very clever. Yeah, definitely. And uh, yeah, this is a great strip. And I loved it last issue. I love it this I issue. also like as well that uh, they actually go exploring the, uh, the cat lands in the present day. And uh, there's the yeah. time mm. obelisk or whatever it is, and Holly just doesn't know about it because she got reprogrammed until Lister gets kidnapped. Um, yeah. I like that. But uh, obviously this is the continuity for the comics, but we never never hear of it again <laughs> after this yeah. adventure. Next up is News from the Dwarf, which is something that at the time would have been a major, major thing that I think most people would have gone for because it's yeah. the build-up to Series 6. And it announces Series 6's titles yep. wrongly. I <laughs> and it also just some Christmas special that we never saw, which makes me sad. Yeah, I mean, I do like the title "Call Me Legion." I think that's quite quite a fun title, but more than so than Legion. But I, I can kind of see why they did it. But yeah, no, the Christmas special would have been interesting because to draw a slight parallel to Doctor Who, we've had the the Doctor Who ones where it's like, well, how are you going to do a Christmas special and involve Christmas? And they always seem to get round it. <laughs> I mean, they've even had Santa Claus turn up in Doctor Who, and I th- would if yeah. they'd done it for Red Dwarf, would they have gone down that line? Wasn't there robot Christmas trees on the, the Christopher? Eccleston? The first one, yeah, was killer robot yeah, yeah. Christmas trees, 
Yeah. And <laughs> is it Capaldi? Yeah, it is Capaldi. The uh, yeah. it's Nick Frost as as Santa Claus in yeah, probably yeah, yeah. one of the best bits of casting they've ever done. Definitely. <laughs> there was eventually a Christmas special for Red Dwarf. It was just shit. Two minutes. I don't think that counts. <laughs> That's no. not canon in any fucking way. Um, I think if the BBC brought it back, took it back over from Dave, and they started doing it again, I think they would do a Christmas special. Dave might do a Christmas special in the future. I should. Because it, it seems like something that there's scope to do, because you're in deep space, and in Dwarf, you can pretty much get away with everything. I'm not going to spoil any of the Dave seasons, but we do meet quite a few people in those seasons you wouldn't expect them to run into. Okay. So David Bowie. No, not David Bowie, sadly. He was in Extras. Ooh. Ooh. The Chuckle Brothers. They're not in it, but it would be fun to get the Chuckle Brothers. Well, maybe not now, but can only get one now. now. What about Chucky? (laughs) Is Chucky in it? No. Your uh, special meter would explode. Chucky was in Ready Player One, yeah. so you don't know. He's been in a science fiction before. In fact, in Ready Player One, the only fuck yeah. in the entire film was because of Chucky, which made me very happy. <laughs> Apart from all the audience that had read the book and quite liked it, mm. going, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> the savagery of your accuracy. <laughs> There's a bit oh. where they mention a making of that's been abandoned, which I think is probably a precursor to Smegums. Mm. Because that came out the uh, November the following year, oh, so okay. I, I think that's probably the early days of of that germinating. Mm. You know, they, they would have been collecting all the footage from that. You know, if they were doing a making of, they'd have had funny bits in it because it's Red Dwarf. Yeah. Also, the uh, the first Red Dwarf audio book, the Infinity Welcomes Careful Drivers, the two cassette version. Which is yeah. the one I had growing up. Two cassettes for seven ninety nine. It's like, oh bloody hell, that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> it's twenty five quid for the six cassette version. I think it was. Yeah, I never listened to the full yeah. sort of long versions. I, I've I've got a very sentimental feel for this for the the two cassette versions of the first two books. I don't think mm. I had either of them, but I have a really kind of irrational hatred of anything being abridged. I feel like it's like cutting the edges off a painting. So I'm very glad that this has kind of faded away because, you know, it costs you $7.99 on Audible, regardless of how long the audio book is these days. And you can't get the abridged versions of Infinity Welcomes Careful Drivers on Audible. You can only get the full six hour yeah. one which if i had to pick between the two it just i mean i know it's got nostalgia for you but if i had to pick between the two yeah. i just wouldn't listen i mean to the yeah six version, hours is still version. these days not that long for an audiobook i no. mean you can get podcasts now that do you know three hours at a time the uh, most recent episode of chart music which is my favorite podcast in the universe was seven hours and 16 minutes yeah. long and Jays. all good not a minute wasted. Yeah. Marvel vs. Marvel, one of my very favourites as well, does gigantic episodes to the point where they split it into two now, but release them both on the same day. And I'm like, so why have we split it into two? <laughs> so I'm ju- just checking on my uh, Audible account for lengths. I don't tend to go on Audible to check out <laughs> lengths. Uh, it's a grinder joke. I thought it might be, yes. Uh, I haven't got that on my yeah. phone, surprisingly. No. Maybe not. It's well good. Dead useful. Not so much for me, probably. Uh, Jerusalem by Alan Moore uh, is the longest audio book that I've got on here, and that's 60 hours and 43 minutes mm. long. And so far so I have been too scared to start it, because I don't know where I will find the time to listen to that. I think the longest one I ever listened to was It, and that was Knocking 40. Yeah. Sorry, I was just looking. I'm just on the uh, the site where I get a lot of my audio books, and uh, they've put all of the Red Dwarf ones together. So yeah, the f- the first two books are there as a 15 hour total. The radio show, however, because they converted the first two books into a radio show. Yeah. For I think Radio Two or Radio Four, that is basically the abridged version with sound effects. It is on. I think it's on YouTube somewhere. I found it for the list for 
things that we do on here and yeah, yeah. um it's actually quite good it's a bit weird but basically it's a full radio production but chris barry's doing all of it but it's pretty much what it is it's quite good fun the other thing i'm really excited about that i don't think actually happened uh in the news from the dwarf is build your own starbug yeah kit build of starbug is being made by the same people that make the doctor who dalek kits that sounds awesome that would have been very cool I don't think it no. happens. Correct us if we're wrong, though, people what are and, doing. And, and send me one. Thanks, by the way. <laughs> the one thing that I clocked was the price of Dimension Jump. Yeah. It was £19, which is £40 in modern-day money. And that's reasonable. I think £40 for Dimension Jump is... Do you know what cool. I clocked about Dimension Jump 93? This news article that they're telling you all about it, it takes place... Mm. On the 2nd to 4th of July, so literally weeks away, and it says that no guests have been confirmed yet. (laughs) I think they had decent guests. I think they just tended to book things right at the last minute back Mm. then. (laughs) Mm. Because I'm fairly certain they're in a future issue that we'll be talking about. I think there's a report from Dimension Jump because uh, they they had one for the previous years, yeah. didn't they? Uh, and they were, they, I say, they always seem to be guest guest wise. They always seem to do quite well. I think right to this day, yeah. it still does pretty well. Mm-hmm. Now, has, has there been one since we've come out of the pandemic? There has. Yes, we missed it. We okay. missed it. We'll have to go to the next one because so, I've never been I to think one. We should. So I'd yeah yeah the online one was ace. Yeah, I definitely would like to go. Um, I've been to a few. Where where I work, we have uh, Hooverville, which is a big Doctor Who convention, and that one's that. One, I mean, that's sold out already. That one's reasonably priced. That one's about twenty quid a ticket, and we've got like McGann, Sylvester McCoy's coming. A lot of the big Finnish doctors are going to be there as well. Are any big Finnish executives cool. going to be there that you can stand behind them going, "Do Red Dwarf, do Red Dwarf," just subliminally? Do crime if we, traveler if as we well. do big finish day again, which we probably will, then I will drop the thing to yeah. them. I'll try and film myself doing it as well, and then I'll send it so we can put it on the social medias. <laughs> definitely, <laughs> definitely. Back to the magazine. The other things that it mentions are the man in the rubber mask, Craig Charles Almanac of everything, and the release of the Tongue Tide single, and then the ongoing saga that I never knew was a thing. About the VHS mm. release of Series 1. Yeah, yeah. Keeps getting put back and put back and put back. Next up is an ad for the Judge Dread Mega Special. I like the way they spell Mega, M-E-G-A. And then later on in the issue on the back cover is the Mad Collector Special advert as well. I mean, I didn't even know you got Mad Magazine. No, in the UK. never read Mad Magazine. Always yeah. kind of went, oh, that looks interesting, but never read it. I used to... Uh, my My dad had a couple of... The paperback book, uh, like normal paperback book size mm. collections of of mad stuff. So I quite liked a few of those, and then from that I used to very occasionally buy. They used to get it. I think it was uh, import copies of it. They used to get to Nostalgian Comics in Birmingham, and whenever I went into Birmingham, I'd pick up a copy. And I remember getting there was a copy when it must have been. 90 are elections every four years or every five four. years so i think it would have been 1993 then so not long after this uh because i got one that was around the time that john major and neil kinnock were up for election because it had a double cover like you flipped the magazine and one said congratulations uh neil kinnock on becoming the new prime minister of the uk and the other one said Congratulations, ha! John Major, on continuing being the Prime Minister of the UK. Um, nice. So, yeah, that would have been May 93. Neil Kinnock. <laughs> Next up is part one of a Chris Barrett interview. And I think we already knew this. He mentions that Alfred Molina yep. was originally looking like he was going to be Doctor. Rimmer. And that he also auditioned for Lister. Yep. One thing I did find interesting, particularly as we've looked at a couple of sitcoms that... One of them got a second mm. series it shouldn't have done. 
that um, the BBC were known for giving things two chances. I think the BBC, because of the way that they funded, had a little bit more freedom to do that kind of thing, whereas ITV, I think their shareholders, were all probably all about the money, and they were like, you know, if this didn't get loads of viewers on the first one and get loads of people watching our adverts, we're going to withdraw our funding if you don't if you make a second series. So capitalism, mm. that kind of bollocks. Yeah, because yeah, I mean, it just makes me think about the all the series that did come out, and especially in the nineties that did get two series. And you're like, why? Like chalk that got two series for no, even though it got panned from the very first episode it's like oh well, we've, we've said it could have two series it could get better and i remember seeing like oh it, it kind of got better but it's still crap one of the ones i remember was called yeah. ain't misbehaving i only watched it because it had peter davison in who was the doctor and it was unsalvageably cack but i continued to watch it because it had peter davison in it. <laughs> and even like 15 maybe 13 year old me i was Surprised that they ain't misbehaving, got a second series, and I watched it because it had Peter Davidson in it, who used to be the doctor. It's your fault it got commissioned for a second one. Yeah. <laughs> it was still cack. 12 episodes of absolute cack. But at the same time, you've got to think about there are there's so many comedy series where they didn't find their feet on the first series. Black Adder. Mm. The first series is nowhere near as good as any of the later ones. It's okay. It's all right. Series two, three, and four are some of the best comedy things ever, you know, comedy series ever made. It's in one of the documentaries about Blackadder where basically they weren't going to do a second one. And then Ben Elton and Richard Curtis basically stripped away as much as humanly possible that they could. Yeah. Because obviously the first one's shot on film, there's horses, there's a castle. And if you look at Blackadder (laughs) 2, a lot of it is like two or three rooms. (laughs) for the most part, yeah, yeah. but it's so good. It's funnier <laughs> by a long way. But it, it, even um, American stuff like uh, Parks and Recreation, mm. I love it, but the first series, or sorry, season, because it's American, is nowhere near as good as it got later on. Yeah, that's the thing that always frustrates me about American TV is they can do the oh, five episodes in and it's not selling billions, let's pull it. Or one series done is like, oh, I didn't do as well as we thought. It only got like 52 million. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like the bit in this interview where he was talking about his inspiration for Ace. Mm. That was that was quite cool and wor- worth a read. Yeah, and how people saw him as differently because he was holding himself as the character yeah. and stuff. Uh, he's talking about as soon as he puts the costume on, he's, that helps him get into the character. And he was more confident when he was dressed as Ace. And the uh, mm. the makeup lady said that he was quite shaggable. <laughs> Which now would get you pulled up in front of a tribunal of some kind. <laughs> it was yeah. the 90s. <laughs> I don't remember the 90s being no. gross. <laughs> because I was living yeah. in it. Yeah. But I think it was. And obviously I'm a, a white man and I was closet at the time. So I was cishet <laughs> and white so, obviously, I didn't see any of the ick, because it was my people doing it. <laughs> I do feel that we should reclaim the term shaggable, but not use it in terms of, in a in a, a romantic sense, just, just in terms of describing something that's good. Like, that sandwich is shaggable. You know, just bring it back in that term, you know. Okay. I mean, that, that brings to mind that quote in uh, What We Do in the Shadows, where they're talking about them having the uh, the blood of virgins is what they prefer. And that's like, put it this way, if you had a sandwich, you'd prefer it if nobody had fucked (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Oh. (laughs) It's true. (laughs) But if you're starting describing sandwiches as a shaggable, that's the implication. (laughs) That's an erotic sandwich. (laughs) I'm going to move on to the next article. Yeah. You broke Colin Carl. <laughs> the phrase, an erotic sandwich, is fucking brilliant. I love it. It's when that. you, Matt, and Kurt get together. <laughs> Understandable. We, we know who's in the middle of that sandwich as well. <laughs> <laughs> Matt. Oh, he's going to love listening Matt. to this one. <laughs> I am Matt. 
Next up is The Ascent of Cat Kind, which is a kind of odd little article about evolution and stuff that I genuinely didn't know. I didn't know that three million years wouldn't have been enough to evolve a cat to a cat person. I thought that they'd got that right. I No, I think the evolution of humans mm. took longer than that. Yeah. I mean, what what they're basically saying in this piece is that cats are mutants. Because yep. the it's the mm. cadmium two that's aid that's boosted the evolution of the cats. So was it squeezing twenty million into just three? So the cats are mutants, which again is not something that gets brought up. But uh, yeah, you know, can't give Danny John Jules too many lines. <laughs> Feels yeah. like a wreck. It's, it's very well written, mm. but then that mm. is because a lot of it is pretty much copied wholesale from Infinity Welcomes Careful Travelers. Yeah. I really okay. did like the timeline. There's a, a, a timeline mm. a, across the bottom. Oh, yeah. the illustrations were yeah. great. They were fucking brilliant. Uh, yeah, like there's there's a, a picture of a, a toy mouse and it says, rubber icon, use unknown. <laughs> I like as what well, you get a picture of, <laughs> of the cat's parents, yes. which I think was quite uh, quite nice. Mm. <laughs> it appears that the, uh, yeah, what were the, uh, the cripple and the idiot? That's the ones. It's very apparent in this photo which one of them, to me, is the idiot. <laughs> yep. <laughs> one of them's just smiling. Cat's licking the back of his hand and just preening himself, wearing an excellent backwards cap. And then yeah. there's one lad in the middle mm. who's just grinning like an absolute tit. And I was like, that's his dad. <laughs> no, I, I think that's Cat in the middle. Is it? I think that is a, that's a child version of oh, Cat. okay. So perhaps the uh, illustrations aren't as good as we thought if they're not that clear. I think the one licking his hand is his dad, the idiot. Oh, okay. I was just going across the line of the where the text underneath said mum, dad and cat. I think they've done a really good yeah. job of drawing a child version of cat. Hair looks immaculate, it has to be said. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was fun and it was silly and it came out of nowhere and I liked it. It was a nice little section. Next up is the Junior Encyclopedia of Space and the Remarkable Red Dwarf Data Bank, which is two extra shit letter pages to add to holograms. Yeah. The Junior Encyclopedia of Space, I mean, some of it just feels like it's staffers knowing little bits of information, like the fact that the set of Justice is the set for Games Master, so they can get away with just going, oh, did you know? It's basically a did you know thing dressed up as a letters page. Yes, because that doesn't give a name. That one's various yeah. questions. <laughs> um, the one that I, I really like, though, on the <laughs> Red Dwarf databank, please settle an argument. Wasn't Nicholas Ball... The, no, that's the wrong one. That, that's not the one I mean. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Rewind. Um, yeah, no, the bit I really like is the question that says, uh, I'm sure I remember the Clangers appearing in Red Dwarf. Which episode were they in? Name provided but withheld due to the stupidity of the question. And then they answer it and point out that it was actually, the Clangers do turn up in on the telly in the Sea Devils Doctor Who episode. Yeah. And then say, by the way, we've got a Best of the Clangers video to give away. I'm fairly certain that entire question was reverse engineered because someone inexplicably gave them a Clangers video. <laughs> I think the whole thing is bullshit. I don't think a single person had written in. It's, it's the the thing as well is uh, they mentioned that Claire Grogan's in the video for Young at Heart by the Bluebells, which yes. I mentally locked away because it was everywhere when it got re-released and went to number one. Um, it was on an yeah. advert or something, wasn't it? But now I'm like, oh, do, do I open that door and go and look at the video to see if Claire Grogan is there? Which apparently she <laughs> is. I don't remember seeing the video. No. I remember them being on top of the pops for weeks and weeks mm. and weeks. Not a, a wet, wet, wet length of yeah. time. But I remember the, it hanging around. I think it was at number one for quite a while. I remember it being um, at number one for quite a while, which is why my brain's kind of rejected it. A bit behind the scenes here. The other day I was at my workplace and that uh, our kitchen team could not remember a song. All they could remember <laughs> is that it went... Susan Vega. Yeah, Tom's yeah. So immediately they're like, do you know what it is, Carl's like, no, I don't, but I know a man who does. Singing it down the phone 30 seconds later to one Colin Jackson Brown. <laughs> 
Yep. <laughs> I think it took him. I mean, I, I it, got it. Yeah, too. got it in two. Yeah, notes. Yeah. I think it took him ten seconds to send me back the thing, and then yeah. literally as soon as I told the the rest coming out of our kitchen was da, 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 da. and there was a our place is next to a wedding vent uh, wedding reception place so this yeah. wedding's reception's out there getting in the car and you could just see some of them going like duh, 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 duh. <laughs> the virus that is tom's diner by suzanne vega <laughs> it's a good one it is like a good it. one yeah, yeah although although her first album's a lot better yeah. i couldn't tell you another song by suzanne vega but i knew the moment you went duh, 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 duh. Mm. it was suzanne vega i mean I think I prefer Vega from Street Fighter 2, but... <laughs> That's based on her. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, it, it, it's really difficult for her to play her guitar with those big fucking knife things on her hands. She can't see the crowd through the mask either. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> what was so that's a that? tangent we oh, weren't yeah. expecting. <laughs> yeah, well, there was another... Right, going back to the Judy Encyclopedia of Bollocks... Um, Is that a grinder thing? Listen... <laughs> Not the junior one. No, <laughs> no, no. It is not. Um, they, they, uh, it says that thirty is over the hill. To oh, Lister. fuck off! Lister is now sixty in the TV series. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. He lives to a hundred and something at least. It's, it's like a hundred and seventy-two or something like that. Yeah, good remembering. You're right. Next up is the comic strip, Jake Bullitt and the case of the casting contestant part seven. It is the conclusion after over half a year. And the art is just as great and weird and odd as it always was. And the ending is fucking brilliant. I thought it was really rushed. That was the only problem I had with it. I like what they've done, but I wish, I, I think they, it feels like the final last bit of it could have done with an extra page to flesh it out a bit more. And maybe even a full screen for him walking away from the uh, explosion. Yeah. It's like the opposite of Lord of the Rings, where the ending takes fucking six months because they just add <laughs> ending after ending after ending after ending, like the end of fucking Purple Rain. Terrible. No, not the film. The The song Purple Rain has just got loads of false yeah. endings. But yeah, the, this when I was reading it, I liked it, but I did really feel that they'd rushed it which maybe they could have got rid of part of the Junior Encyclopedia of Space mm. and given it a bit of an extra page. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Well, maybe they could have just got rid of the entirety of the Junior Encyclopedia of Space. <laughs> my, one of the things throughout this whole strip, it was I do enjoy this strip, I love the art on it, was Bob Monkhouse's people <laughs> must have been... Because there's, there's no real hiding it. The main character in the main what turns out to be the villain in this, the game show host antagonist, is yeah. Bob Monkhouse. Yeah, it's a it's a photo yes. of him. But he, either he must have been really <laughs> fine about this kind of thing, or they just thought, let's not mention it and see what happens. <laughs> Pretty sure Bob Monkhouse didn't read the. Red we don't Wolf know that. Magazine. Bob Monkhouse was was a legend. <laughs> <laughs> he was. Mob Hunkhouse mm. was even better. Was that your name on Grind? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just I don't want okay. Bob Bolmer to. <laughs> He's dead. He's dead. Someone shot yeah, him. You sorted that, didn't you, Mark? May or may not have been me. <laughs> yeah, it, might. it was me. I Spoilers. Did it. I, don't, I would have done. We don't know who did it. I don't even know whose idea it was to shoot I'm Bob. fairly certain it was Matt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because <laughs> he want, Matt wasn't around every time Hob has turned up. Matt hasn't been there. He was it's asleep weird. on the sofa. Uh, then there's a poster. There's a poster, you're right. And it is a decidedly average poster, but a poster hey, nonetheless. It's, it's a poster where Hattie Hayridge just looks really bored and pissed Her off. Her eyes are pretty much closed <laughs> she on does. it. You're like, yeah. Craig, like, Craig Charles looks <laughs> like. I don't know. He looks hungover. He's just like st- it probably was. Yeah, he's he, he looks rough, and you just thought, you know, Chris <laughs> Barry looks annoyed. You know, it's just this thing of like, oh, we could have taken another one. Nah, bugger it. Because this is blatantly a press photo, isn't it? In fact, Danny John Jules is the <laughs> only one that is looking at the camera yeah. and looks like he doesn't 
absolutely hate the fact that he's having his photo taken. Yeah. <laughs> Which makes sense, because yeah. yeah. he always looks cool yeah. as fuck. He's the only one who doesn't look homicidal. <laughs> or Sir Chi. I wouldn't have noticed as a kid, and I'd have gone, oh, it's Red Dwarf, yeah, yeah. and I'd have put the post on, we're being hypercritical as a bunch of middle-aged men. Yep. But, <laughs> it is crap. It is It is crap. Yeah. I'm sorry, it's crap. So anyway, Peter Rag turns yeah. up. Do you know what? I'm all about the being more yes. Peter Rag, and it's a short article creating space about a very specific element of Red Dwarf, the creation of the model of Red Dwarf itself. Yeah. And um, I think it's fucking mm. insane that Peter Rag says that he was disappointed with it. Yeah, it, it, he, he's talking about... I, I don't think it's the model he was disappointed with. I think he's talking about the um, the transition shots in the title sequence from Lister painting it because they couldn't quite get it to look, you know, completely seamless. But do you know what? I never noticed any issue with it at no. all. But... When it's your own work, you are going to notice the mistakes and that kind of thing. He's uh, the, the problem he says was they couldn't get the camera in quite close enough to the model for it to look right for the scale mm-hmm. of it, which makes sense. You know, you'd have to use like a really macro lens or yeah. something like that to do it, which they probably didn't have. But he did an amazing yeah. job. He's he's an absolute genius. I think there's a bit that mentions other things that he worked on. Yeah, he's, he did Thunderbirds and Captain Scarlet. Yes, it mentions that, and then I went to IMDb to see what else Peter Rag had done. The main one I remember is he did Bottom. So he did Bottom, he did the t- Detectives, uh, he did Doctor Who, as you'd expect. But the one I was most excited about that he did, he did Threads! Really? Yes. Oh, God. What's Threads? I thought it was that shit social media I don't no, like. No, Threads is... A British TV movie made in the mid to late eighties yeah. about a nuclear bomb landing on Sheffield, yeah. and it's harrowing as fuck, but amazing. It's brutal. Yeah, wasn't that when the wind blows? No, it was about the same sort of time, okay. but it, it was the height of Cold War paranoia. Yeah. But Threads is an absolutely amazing film, but it will fuck yeah. you up. It, at, at the um, time, it, apparently, it really put the shit up people. Yeah. Shall I put it on the special? No, because it's not close enough connected to Red Dwarf in any way, apart from Peter Rag. It's Peter closer. Rag worked on it. Okay, it's closer than fucking Gap of the Trifibian Monster. You knew what it I was going to say. Um, I don't want to watch it. <laughs> yeah, it's... It, is it really that bad? I'm genuinely It's amazing, yeah. but it is not a fun watch. No. It also leads to one of the most notable IMDb entries ever. There's uh, an actress called Anne Seller who only ever appeared in Threads. And her sole appearance in any acting medium was urinating lady. Because she's the lady that pisses herself when the nuclear bomb hits. I remember seeing, I haven't watched it in a long time, but I remember seeing a clip of it popped up on, it was on Charlie Brooker. When he was talking about sort yeah. of impact of TV, and they showed the scene of the bomb going off, and yeah, even now they're just like it's like oh, it it puts a chill down you could to because I've as we're recording this, this is when Oppenheimer's currently in cinemas, yes. and uh, I've seen it working as a projectionist. I've seen most of it now about eight times, <laughs> um, and so the actual recreation of of things in that is very. Visceral. visceral and harrowing to watch. Yeah, yeah. There's uh, that that particular scene. Yeah. So I once got to the semi-final of the Tamworth Battle of the Bands yep. with a uh, project called Trommel Machine SR88, which was me with an old late seventies drum machine going into a bass amp with uh, loads of delay effects and various other effects pedals on it, and a guitar with all of the strings tuned to the same note and random samples of numbers stations and Charles Manson and, and weird shit. And uh, I had a projectionist, and we basically... I, it was a 20-minute set where I just played one piece of music and projected the scene from Threads where the nuclear yeah. bomb hits, just on a loop. And uh, half of the audience were terrified. Somehow it got to the fucking semi-finals. But I didn't wasn't able to get the projectionist for the uh, semi final, so I just borrowed as many strobe lights as I could 
and pointed every single one of them at the audience uh, in front of me, so they couldn't even see me while I was playing, and it was just uh, strobe lights. Nice. That was fun. (laughs) And this is why I don't go to see local bands. (laughs) Next up is... The article on Future Echoes that is on the front cover. And it's kind of a 50% good, 50% shit. I love the behind the scenes stuff, but what's the point of the synopsis? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there is the thing that we've talked about in previous ones in that the first series is is kind of rare at this point. Yeah. Oh, shit. Good point. Um, And it's not coming. It's it's still not coming out. Still not out. So if you if you're looking at some of the photos in this, where you've got like you know, there's Lister's grandmother, you know, there's Rimmer with a beehive hairdo and Lister holding baby twins. You're like, what the hell happened in this episode? Yeah, mm. it could be a very subversive there's- advertisement for the videos when they do come out. There's actually a really interesting point made about Bexley's death. Lister doesn't mourn the death of his son whatsoever in Future Echoes, and it kind of highlights that that's absolutely the antithesis of how mm-hmm. Lister would have behaved. He wouldn't have tap danced at his own kid's death. And yeah, that really stuck out to yeah. me. I, I mean, like, this, this is during the period where Craig Charles is quite critical of his performance. I remember seeing the, uh, watching the episode with the commentary on. Where he does the uh, the dance and he he does the squat and he kind of pops back up again with his hands behind his head. And you Craig Charles on the country go, oh, I can't do that anymore. <laughs> um, but then he does the the admittedly pretty bad delivery of Rimmy, You saw me son die, and Craig Charles is like, oh oh, could have done that again. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, this is the thing, though. It's uh, those early years, isn't it, where they're not quite sure. As far as they're aware, they don't know if they're coming back for an- another series or mm. what. So, But uh, one thing I need to point out about Future Echoes is mm. the beehive gag is one of my favourite gags <laughs> in all of yep. Red Dwarf ever. It's just, it's just so silly and so humili- it's, it's because it's humiliating mm. Rimmer, obviously, but it's just great. It's just great. Chris Barry's delivery of you are how you look and I look like a complete and total tit total is tit. probably one of, it's still probably one of the best deliveries in the whole series. Mm, I agree. Another notable bit I thought of in, in this particular article though, we've obviously when Rob and Doug split up, we've talked quite a lot in the last few series about how Doug is more into the drama side of things. Mm. Whereas Rob was more driving the comedy, it mentions that as far back as this. Yeah, you've got a bit in there where yeah. where it mentions how Doug was keen to get more sort of drama involved, and I I, I was surprised that it, it you know that was apparent as far back as just before series six was released. I mean, by this point they've made mm. they've finished making series six, so. They've worked together for the last time, mm. really, at yeah. that point. There's no clues in anything else that they're going to split up, mm. but perhaps that is one of the first clues. Yeah. The next article is what's happening next month, and they are heavily hyping a new comic strip called Mima's Crossing, which sounds mm. absolutely fucking wild. So I'm looking the, forward to I that. I think we need to read the synopsis because it is... It's fucking brilliant. The Godfather meets the Jetsons in an epic tale of sex, drugs, greed, and ex-Saturday morning TV presenters as prostitute without a heart of gold Trixie LaBouche and wheeler dealer Astro Dutch Van Istrogen take on the Ganymede Mafia. Gangland murders, illegal body swapping, severed horses' heads, we've got them all next issue. Looking forward to that. Don't disappoint me, Smegazine. I mean, it does kind of highlight that maybe this isn't aimed at kids and that's why you shouldn't have had it, Gatlin. Absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) And other than that, we've got some more of the Chris Barry interview. There's a Danny John Jules interview and an article on Crichton's makeup, all of which sound bloody lovely. So I'm looking forward to next issue. Then we've got... uh, Android. Everybody needs good Android. (laughs) I love it. I still love it. So it's... It's cack. I don't understand. I don't think this one's as bad as some of the yeah. other ones. I like the joke about the two decapitated heads going, hang on, what with? 
<laughs> yeah, that's good. Okay, credit where credit's due. This particular one has an environmentalist agenda, which is very much my wheelhouse. <laughs> And the reference to Garbage World did not get missed out. I was very pleased that there was a nod towards Garbage World. But it's still cack. My favourite thing about it is, if you go back to that initial scene in Crichton, where they watch androids, is the when someone says, hey, it's so-and-so, and and they go, you mean my, and then explain everything about that person in a quick sentence. They do that here. But it's like, look, it's JC. What? You mean my evil, illegitimate son, JC, from whom I've sworn to take back the family firm? I love that. If you read everything like it's Calculon, it's great. (laughs) (laughs) It is quite good at what it does, but unfortunately what it does isn't funny. I like it. I know you do, and I'm glad you do. It proves that this magazine I'm is I'm launching for my everyone. own podcast where I come up with new episodes of Androids. And I'm doing all the voices. <laughs> I mean, we could put it as a special if you want. Mm. <laughs> Next up is an article on Red Dwarf 6. And at the time, this would have been exactly what Mark yeah. wanted. I think the thing with our season six blurb is they keep mentioning like, oh, they've lost Red Dwarf. It's like, don't spoil it. You know, it's, mm. you know, we're still weeks away. We've, it's like, ah, oh, don't do this. You wouldn't do it now. You definitely wouldn't do it now. What would happen now is they'd put the trailer yeah. out and people would watch it scene by scene and go, there's no Red Dwarf in there. Yeah. Mm. And there'd be theories mm. going yeah. around. And then they'd reveal it, and that would be way more fun. Yeah, but probably yeah, really. Yeah, I I remember when the first series of Doctor Who, the Eccleston series, came out. They'd they'd release the teaser trailer at the end of the episode for the next episode, and it was the two part finale. And they did this whole thing of like, oh, this is happening. And then he he, he asks the Daleks, how did you, you survive the time war? And you just hear a voice go, they survived through me, but they don't show who it is. All week, yeah. I was like, who is it? It's so-and-so, it's Davros, it's this, it's that, the other. Uh, it turned out to be an Emperor Dalek, which was a bit of a letdown. But there, yeah. was, which, but there was. were so many different things I saw online going, oh, it's going to be this. You know, it's the guy, it's the lad that they dumped with the thing in his head earlier in the series, come back and he's turned into something. You know, it's just like it, all sorts of stuff. And I I love that kind of thing. No one said it was the Rani. No, I'm still waiting for there to be a new Rani. I think there will be at some point. Next up is time slides and stasis leaks. And there's more synopsis, and a dig at Star Trek and about that's about I've got. It's, it's another that. one of the things that this magazine does to fill space every now and again, where it picks a topic yeah. and then lists every episode that's had something even closely related to that topic yeah. in it. When we're familiar with all of the episodes, it's a bit pointless. Mm. Mm. I, I mean, it's it's good. I mean, it's essentially a Wikipedia entry about time travel and stuff in Red Dwarf, isn't it? Which yeah. back then, maybe, like you mm. said, back then would have been a good read. But yeah. To us now is just oh, so it's the hindsight thing, isn't it? It's yeah, yeah, and yeah, maybe I'll be we are being a little bit unfair, but I don't care. Yeah. It sucked, hated it. Moving on. Next up is read any good books lately, and it's a pun. It's R E D instead of R E A. Same as it has been every time. <laughs> I like puns, and every time there's a pun, I like to point out that there's a pun. There's a pun. <laughs> I was quite excited on this one. It's a bit crap, though, isn't it? Yeah, because <laughs> it's got Mort and Dirt Gently. Yeah. Well, yes, but they were both ancient books. Why are they reviewing really old because books? Because at that point, is probably about the time I read both of them for the first time. Mm. So... You know, they were still being discovered by 11-year-olds at that point. Yeah, but, I mean, I had, of all the books they've got on the article, I hadn't read Mars by Ben Vova, and that actually sounds okay. But, I mean, more. More had been released over six years previously. Maybe it was a reprint. Yeah. No, the, the reason that they've mentioned that is because 
they wanted to get a Discworld book mentioned and they were trying to think where a good place to start for people is because it mentions in the article that The Colour of Magic is, despite being the first book in the series, not a good place to start because it's one of the worst Discworld books. So right. It hasn't picked up enough of the feel and the humour of it yet, though. Um, he, you know, Pratchett mm. hadn't quite found where he was going with it at that point. And every few years I go, I'm going to start reading Discworld all the way from the start. And I read Colour of Magic and then I get bored. Mm. <laughs> and I've done it so many times. Mm. And this is mm. basically saying the best thing to do with Discworld books is choose a different thread, like reading the um, the Witches books or um, you know the, the Watch or someone like that. And they're saying, basically, at this point, if you want to start reading the death books, Mort is the first one of those, and that's a good place to start. Yeah. Which I can't argue with, because Mort is fantastic. I, I think my favourite Discworld book is Soul Music, but Mort is brilliant as well, because I, I, death is one of my favourite characters in all of the Terry Pratchett books. I must admit, I've never... I think I bought one and tried reading one, but this might be the same where I was what I did with the Hitchhiker's Guide that I probably bought one quite far in and not realised it. Uh, but I've uh, never really got into Discworld. I think Matt is the main one of us that is the Discworld aficionado. Mm. Is that the right word? Aficionado? Aficionado? I don't know. It's a word I've only ever read. Effect, effect, affection, affectionado? Fuck knows. Oh, aficionado. I, I say reservoir, yeah. so, you know. I'm not an authority on things. I've read, like, I think the first 10 or 12 of them and then just fell out with it. <laughs> None of them are as good as Good Omens, which is my favourite book of all time. I need to watch the series. <laughs> I really need to watch the series. Yeah, yeah. you do. Um, I've just watched the second series and it's very, 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 very yeah. good, despite not being based on the book because the book is just the first series. Yes. I think the performance. Oh, okay. I see clips all over, like, social media and stuff, and I've managed to avoid spoiling it for myself so far really i've seen bits of it that i can't can't avoid but i'm quite looking forward to uh sitting down and watching it properly have you seen the first series no at all yet? i need to sit down and watch it do it do it yeah. do it it's fantastic next up is greetings from gelf world and the art is magnificent in this comic strip yeah definitely i mean it's prepping for the uh Mimus Crossing that's coming as well because that's in a very similar style to this. It's, it's David Littleton who's he's done a couple of the previous ones as well. Yeah. And it's absolutely grim, bleak satire and commentary. And I'm quite a fan of bleak and grim satire and commentary. And this was just vicious and cruel and cynical and completely and utterly without any kind of redemption yeah. it was fantastic <laughs> yeah. yeah i always remember great. the part when i first read this was that the uh the prisoner drig finally convincing the prison door to join him in a revolution because everything on gelf world is a gelf even his yeah. prison which is a, a really so, good concept yeah. i like it Next up is holograms. Uh, there's a tasteless joke about someone taking their own life. Oh, that letter, yeah, a grim letter about Holly leaving. Is it? It manages to have two bits going on about you know this is a suicide note. Fuck off. Horrible. Then it's also they published. I know, that. and it's also got stuff about the the picture of uh, Holly in issue thirteen was so beautiful I had to buy another one because we slobbered all over the first one. It's like, fuck, why would you print that? It's just, don't indulge these. It's clearly a young teenager that's written yeah. it in, but they they don't need indulging. But what I did like is there is a letter in there where somebody is complaining, Dear Red Dwarf Smegazine, I'm afraid I'm going to be a real smeghead and start by complaining about your failure to give us any warning about the Book of Scripts Primordial Soup. At least I can't find any reference to it. Obviously sent in before the previous issue, which had about seven different references to the Primordial Soup script book, which, you know, <laughs> I, was, I was commenting on yesterday's episode that it was mentioned. They were really trying to sell the Primordial Soup script yeah. book. <laughs> mm. There's a very fun drawing of there Mr. Flibble. 
Yes. Uh, and a lad who's dre- a seventy year old who's dressed up as Crichton for uh, a ho- for something a homemade uh, Crichton outfit, which is just adorable. Yeah, that's what letter yeah. pages are. His costume for. shit though. <laughs> You're vicious. <laughs> Just because it's true doesn't mean it's not me. It's fine. It'd be nearly my age now. <laughs> Hang on. What's the name you on this photograph? If he's listening in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Kurt <laughs> North. <laughs> Tony Peak. Right. Okay, Tony Peak. If you're listening in, <laughs> I know Colin's address. I'll give it you. I won't. <laughs> Next up is the. Hologram Protection Act of 2143. And I just found it flippant mm, and unpleasant. Yeah. Like, just nasty and, oh, ick. Yeah. Also, we were trying to cram in a lot of reading this and making notes over the weekend. And I didn't want to le- read a legal document, <laughs> even if it is a spoof <laughs> of a legal document. I, I just kept reading it going... No, brain's not computing this. <laughs> Let's go to another page. <laughs> now, as a concept, the legality of holograms isn't looked at at all in yeah. the series. And I think that is something that would be of value, of interest. And I'd be very interested in that on the telly show, maybe. There was a little bit in Back to Earth, I suppose, where they discussed whether or not it was murder to kill a yeah. hologram. But I think that would be a fascinating topic, just not the yeah. way it was looked at here. There's one thing which is slightly funny, which is accepted conventions dictate that a living amoeba outranks a dead third technician. Yeah. Well, laborator- laboratory animals may or may not be deemed superior to a hologram. There's a slight issue with that. Isn't Rimmer a second technician? Yeah. It's listed as a it, third It is. Technician. So the whole point of... There's a, a note at the bottom saying, in accordance with Section 2, Paragraph 1 of this Act, Dave Lister was charged with the undue, albeit temporary, termination of Arnold J. Rimmer after a visit to the Waxworld theme park. Presiding judge was Holly, she being the senior representative of the owner of the Jupiter Mining Corporation. The trial was convened at the request of Mr. Rimmer, but the case was dismissed following Mr. Lister's announcement that he'd just discovered an ill amoeba. But that doesn't necessarily outrank Rimmer. Yeah. I think they've forgotten what rank Rimmer was when they wrote it. Probably. Next up is Trek Dwarf, and it's a report about a combi of Star Trek and Red Dwarf convention. And that's a peculiar thing that I didn't know existed. I knew of Trek Dwarf at the time. Um, Had no no interest in half of it. (laughs) <laughs> but well, you know, was quite interested in the the Red Dwarf side. Obviously, I really like this article. There's so a couple of I. things in it that I thought were absolutely brilliant. That obviously the the special guest was Danny John Jules, who the convention took place over the weekend that they'd finished filming series mm. six. So Danny John Jules was collected from the rap party at four o'clock in the morning. Oof and driven from London to Leicester by one of the organisers of the convention. I love how low-key that is. Mm. It's like, you know, there's no promotion Mm. companies involved in this. It's some people that are fans of Red Dwarf and Star Trek that have booked it all, and they're going around chauffeuring people, and they really want to get Danny Danny John Jules there, so they go and pick him up from a party at 4 o'clock in the fucking morning. (laughs) Part of it feels like it was just Danny John Jules on his way back to his hotel or whatever, and a car pulls up and goes, hey, Danny, do you want to come meet some? (laughs) Get in the car. Do you want a lift, Danny? And he goes for a nap in the back, and he wakes up in Leicester. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, there's loads of fans here. I'll hang out with them. The thing I liked about it was how it kind of put you back into the 90s of a kind of pre-internet world. And... Red Dwarf Series 1 is rare. Star Trek is behind the USA and the UK. No one's seen the Red Dwarf USA pilot. It's fascinating. The bit about the Red Dwarf pilot is my favourite bit, at spoilers for the end of the episode, my favourite bit in the entire magazine. Because, uh, let me just read this. Viewings of the rare first series of Red Dwarf were packed, as were the showings of the new Star Trek episodes, Unfortunately, the American Red Dwarf pilot, which remains unbroadcast in any country, couldn't be shown as promised. 
TV company Universal actually sent the convention organisers a copy, but under strict instructions not to show it. What? Why did they send them a copy and tell them they couldn't show anybody? Describe the box to people. (laughs) Here it is. Don't watch it. (laughs) Maybe they knew. I mean, that's the sensible thing to do, is not watch the Red Dwarf USA pilot, as you guys know very well. Indeed. Perhaps it was, here it is, don't watch it, it's Mm. shit. I like that it was for charity as well. They had an auction for charity and raised over a £1,000. Okay, so here's the thing about that auction. Again, I looked at inflation. It's about 2,050 quid they made. You would sell memorabilia like the kind of shit that was available here. Star Mm. Trek and Red Dwarf. Each item would go for £2,050 each now. At the beginning of the article, it's like several hundred Red Dwarf and Star Trek fans descended on a hotel in Leicester one weekend, and you just feel like it, was, it would go to, to fight. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it, it, it mentions in there that the, the main star thing of the auction was Lister's freshly pulled off dreadlocks, mm. uh, which went for £55. Yeah. 55 quid for the actual dreadlocks that he wore in the show. So I was quite interested to see if anything like that had sold again. So I did. I tried to have a look for like on eBay for Red Dwarf, Dave Lister, dreadlocks. Couldn't find anything like that. But I found a website called Prop Store. Which nice. Which gives us, there is there are 16 things on the Red Dwarf page. Most of them are models of Starbug um, used in... Various different series. Uh, so, how much do you reckon a, a model of Starbug goes for? 300 quid. 8,000 pounds. Right, you, Carl, you are nowhere okay. near. So, there's uh, models of Starbug here. The cheapest one sold for 2,995. But the most expensive one sold on the 18th of October 2021, so less than two years ago. For seventy five thousand pounds, I said eight thousand and thought I was being a bit yeah. ambitious. Seventy five thousand uh, pounds. There's a, a baby, a ba- one of the baby scutters, sold for seventeen thousand five hundred pounds. I remember we looked at those as well in a previous issue of this magazine, and I think they sold for about fifty or sixty quid each. At the if time, my yeah. Serves. Somebody made a profit. Fuck. Lister's acoustic guitar from the early series. Uh, sold for 2,812 quid, which... Is that Mr. Guitar? Uh, no, that was his electric later on. Crichton's uh, naked suit, mm. so the, the flesh-coloured suit from... Uh, is that Series 8? Was Three. That, was that from Crichty TV? It depends which one. Is that one. when he's in the showers? Yeah. There was one in Series was. 3, though, wasn't there? The one that got used and they didn't make the cut. Oh, it could yeah. be. Uh, that that sold for three thousand and seventy five pounds. Uh, then you've got there's a bazookoid uh, sold for one thousand seven hundred and ninety five pounds. I would have thought it would have gone for more than that. Actually, a bazookoid. The matter paddle, same price, one thousand seven hundred and ninety five, uh, and also the plasma time drive went for the same price. Crichton's uh, David Ross uh, Butler costume, the sort of PVC mm-hmm. tuxedo kind of thing, one thousand two hundred and fifty. Rimmer's uh, pink cavalier costume, which was was that better than life? No, that was terraform. Um, it was Rimmer's terraform. Yeah, yes, uh, nine hundred and ninety-five. Mark, pounds. you spent nine hundred and ninety-five pounds on that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, the cheapest one was the uh, junior in, junior color encyclopedia of space, which went for three hundred and nine pounds in nineteen ninety-nine. Bloody hell! But yeah, I thought that was quite interesting. Yeah, they got some serious <laughs> bargains in that. You've got to remember there was some Star Trek merchandise yeah. in there yes. as well. And imported from the States, memorabilia. I mean, fucking hell. A thousand pounds, which is now 2,050 in modern inflation. Yeah. yeah. That's batshit. Absolutely batshit. Something bat they mentioned in this as well is that Gene Roddenberry's only just recently died. I, I forgot that. that. I thought he'd, he passed away long before. So the, the the main Star Trek guest they've got there is a guy called Richard Arnold, who uh, I don't know if he's that well-known with Trekkies because I'm not one. Mm. Uh, he was a Star Trek archivist mm. who worked really closely with Gene Roddenberry, and his job was 
basically to um, say yes or no to various different Star Trek projects. Ah. And he, he apparently got quite a reputation for being really brutal. Um, like people would say, oh, can I do this Star Trek extended no- uh, universe novel sort yeah. of thing? And he'd be like, no, fuck off. Um, but I like the fact that he was at the convention. He was wearing a Starbucks sweatshirt. Which I kind of want to like see that. what that was. Yeah, there's no picture, yeah. which is a shame. Next up is an article called Kachansky's Back, which is a interview with C.P. Grogan. And we understand why she's called C.P. Grogan, because that is covered in the article itself. And um, I know people who've struggled with that before, the um, Actors' Union not allowing yeah. you to use your real name because someone else has claimed Yeah, because there's another Claire Grogan. And when, when she turned up the first time on set, when she went to the makeup room, they got a photo of the wrong Claire Grogan in there, as she says in the uh, the interview. I tried looking up what the other Claire Gro- Grogan had been in, but she doesn't have an IMDb entry. So uh, obviously yeah. didn't get to be as successful, um, which is probably why our Claire Grogan is allowed to use her actual name now. I was going to say, I was sure Claire <laughs> Grogan is Claire Grogan these days on there. Uh, she yeah. is. Mm. Perhaps she... Uh, Defeated the other one in Mortal Kombat. Not the game, actual Mortal Kombat. There can only be one had, Claire Grogan. <laughs> they had a fight to the death. But this sceptical makes a really big deal of CP Grogan coming back. And um, it did just make me smile because it was just a yeah. tiny little cameo. And then the next series, Chloe was yeah. in more... Well, Chloe had more screen time in One episode. the first episode of Series 7 than <clears throat> C.B. Grogan did in any, across the across the whole yeah. the first six seasons. Yeah. Did you notice, though, with we, we've been mentioning how spoilery they've been earlier on, she's really, really cagey and wouldn't tell them what she was doing in, in the series, which is great. It's great, but it's probably because she was embarrassed. She was in it for about 20 seconds. <laughs> yeah, I'm only in it for, like... Mm. One line. <laughs> she is pretty badass in that yeah. scene. Uh, the thing is, as well, is uh, again, it's it's the thing that kind of bugs me. Is they've announced it. She's back. It would have been an amazing thing for them to not announce it. Yeah. I mean, at least they don't announce Anita Dobson's mm, in it. True. <laughs> true. I had to look up who Alexandra Pig was because there's a lot about Miss Pig in this, and then. Um, uh, Alexandra Pig is a stage name. So the lady who acts under the name Alexandra Pig could have gone for any name she wanted, but she chose to be called mm-hmm. Miss Pig. Why? Why, why, Maybe the same why? as the Claire Grogan thing. She gets hired by the Muppets because of a typo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kermit's like, who the fuck is this? <laughs> She was actually a relatively big, like, 80s actor in Brookside. But, right. You know. But, yeah, she got to choose whatever name she wanted. And she went for Alexandra Pig. She could have been Mark Adams. She probably couldn't. I don't think I could be Mark Adams. It's a really common name, and there's <laughs> bound to be someone with that as a murder fair, already. Fair, fair. I did a um, wrestling show as a referee because we hadn't got any a couple of months back. And um, I decided I didn't want to be Mark Adams because obviously it was my, uh, it was my evil clone. And um, I decided I was Adam Marks <laughs> and everyone found that very funny. <laughs> so my referee name is officially Adam Beautiful. Marks. Just looking here, I altered know. images, which gets mentioned a bit in this article, are still playing and uh, are playing in London on October the 26th and Glasgow on September the 10th. And I think they do a lot of the... Uh, 80s weekenders at Butlins and all those kind of things. They do. And that's fun because she talks about how it feels like so yeah. far in the past being in altered images in this article. I got that as well. What I really liked in the article, though, is there's an old reprint of a page from um, Eagle comic, which they were able to do because it's the same publisher, it's Fleetway. Yeah. So they didn't even have to get any copyright from that. They could just reprint that page. And it's it's great because it's a a little music magazine section from 1981, which I always find interesting reading old music magazines. 
You should do a podcast about that, Colin. I should, shouldn't I? Particularly the CDs and tapes. I just had a look mm. and I found on um, on YouTube altered images live at Belladrum from the BBC on yep. the 27th of July of this year, so on a few weeks away, and Claire Grogan looks absolutely fantastic. She's got a big sequin dress on, feather boa, huge outsized glasses, and she looks like she's having the time of her life. <laughs> I watched uh, Punk Rock Factory set from Belladrum uh, the other yeah. day. It's really weird because it's from BBC Alba. Yes, the, the Gaelic channel, so, isn't it? So the, the people doing the, like, where Joe Wiley would be on the Glastonbury footage are all speaking in Gaelic. And it's, I've never seen people speaking in Gaelic on the telly. It was really cool. I remember, Didn't understand any of yeah, it. But. I remember spending some time in Glasgow for to go see wrestling, a show that both me and Mark went to. Uh, yeah, but you were in the cheap seats. Yeah, I was. I was in the cheap seats. I, I don't have the connections you have. <laughs> um, well, I didn't at the time. But uh, <laughs> but I was in my hotel and I was just sort of channel hopping and uh, I ended up watching Danger Mouse in Gaelic, which was frigging hilarious. <laughs> yeah, when I yes. used to go to my nan's house in Wales uh, when I was a, a kid... I used to watch uh, S4C and just watch random cartoons in Welsh as well. Next up is the profile of Dwayne Dibley. And it just comes across as really cruel. Yeah. Yeah. And what I think was really important about Dwayne Dibley is that he wasn't an incel. No. He didn't behave with that entitlement and childishness his childishness was much more innocent and likable and the vitriol he gets in this article feels really mean yeah it's like they've totally misjudged it haven't they yeah but i also think there's a bit in the um the Dwayne dibley comic strip next which is in a similar vein but we'll get onto that in a minute Mm. yeah so that's next it is the Dwayne dibley comic strip and it's called home And it was just a bit odd to me. And I felt like there really wasn't enough in the two pages it was given to really get much out of it. We've had previous two parts. Uh, That's that's how it works when it's part three. That was quite a redundant thing I just said, wasn't it? The main issue I have on this, now I think it is mentioned in one of the episodes, something about him living in a Salvation Army hostel. Yeah. Hmm. That really didn't sit well with me in this in this comic because it's playing it for laughs in a ha ha he's homeless kind of way, which is mm. that's not cool. I work for a housing association, so I'm speaking to people every day who are homeless and are living in hostels and stuff like that. And it's not fucking mm. funny. Hostels are a necessary evil. They you know, they they are somewhere for people to live in while they're trying to find somewhere more permanent. But it's not something to be fucking mm. mocked. You know, there, there are absolutely fucking criticisms to be made about the Salvation Army with them being a massively fucking yes. homophobic and transphobic organisation. They supported Section 28. They've, you know, supported conversion therapy and bollocks like that. The one thing they do in their hostels as well is if you are a heterosexual couple, you're allowed to yep. share a room. If you're a homosexual couple, you yep. are not. So... Uh, Fuck the Salvation Army, apart from the few Agreed. people that very much do need to stay in their hostels. <laughs> but yeah. Well, that was heavy. <laughs> ah, sorry. Well, they put it right at the end of the fucking magazine, so I had to... Uh... Oh, no, they didn't. There's a fucking Omnizone bit that I've skipped. <laughs> yeah, so we've got news from the Omnizone. Let's talk about that. And um, the Babylon 5 pilot speculation made me smile, and I... Always thought Babylon 5 was better than uh, Deep Space Nine. And, yeah, there's some information about Star Trek Six, and they found some Patrick Troughton stories. But this is Red Dwarf magazine. I, I don't understand. As I said yesterday, uh, it's it's a dry run for SFX magazine. Yeah. There's a couple of things in here that I did notice. One was they talked about how things that were trying to pick up where Deep Space Nine left off. Uh, and one of them is Space Rangers, which I have seen the trailer for because I subscribe to a YouTube channel who puts compilations of uh, show intros 
from through the years. Of course you do. A very cool thing yeah. to do. You are the tap master. Um, but yeah, Space Space Rangers was one. And it had like a decent cast. And it looked like it had quite a bit of money thrown at it. But yeah, according to this, it only lasted four episodes. And also there's one called Time Tracks, which I do kind of remember and looked cheap and crap from what I remember. But seeing that was interesting. And also talking about Tech War, William Shatner's Tech War. Yeah. Um, which the main thing I remember about it is there's a terrible video game that's based off it. And William Shatner appeared on Monday Night Raw to promote it because it was on after Monday Night Raw. And he yeah. did a monkey flip to Jerry the King Lawler. He did a monkey flip of all the moves. You'd have thought he'd have done a Stone Cold Stunner. Well, this was 1993. <laughs> oh, okay. So oh. I remember reading reviews of the uh, the computer mm. game. Uh, computer and video, computer and video games magazine at the time, and yes, I'm fairly certain it got a very bad review. Yeah, there is again. There's a guy on on YouTube who plays a lot of like first person shooters, and uh, he played the Tech War one, and it's got William Shatner in it in like full motion video. Yeah, and he just basically slags you off the whole time, <laughs> which is probably what would happen nice. if he was there in real life. Yeah. So true. Ah, <sighs> dear. So that was Red Dwarfs Magazine Volume 2, Issue 2. We will now discuss what we thought was the worst article in the magazine. And uh, I don't even know. There was quite yeah. a lot of shite. All three of the letter pages were shit for me. Um, I found the hollow protection thing really mm. distasteful. I didn't like the profile of Dwayne yeah, Dibley. That's mine, Dwayne Dibley profile. Yeah. Same. They they got the tone totally wrong. He's a lovable character. I think I agree. So it's it's almost right wing humour. Left wing humour punches up, and right wing humour kicks yeah, yeah. down. And I don't find kicking down something yeah. that's funny no. personally. No, they, they they should be better than that, and they usually were. Yeah, I mean, Red Dwarf is fundamentally a left wing program yep. concept culture. Because frankly, look yep. at the cast. Yep. Anyway. Favourite things. How about you go first this time, Carl? Uh, for me, it's actually uh, Greetings from Gelf World. It's probably one of the better one-off strips that they've done. And I just I really love the art style on it. And it makes me excited to coming into the Mimus Crossing that we're going to be having in the next few episodes. Yeah. Colin? That revelation about Universal sending the uh, the tape of the US pilot, but telling them that they couldn't show it, that's, that just made the whole issue for me. I, I laughed for about <laughs> ten minutes when I read that. I, I love the absurd uh, the absurdity of it. It's ridiculous. So I really struggled with a favourite, as much as I struggled with the worst, actually. And um, I almost always go for a comic strip, but the creating space article was just a nice, yeah. tight little fun info thing, and I nearly went for it, but then, like Carl, greetings from Gelf World was. F- Fucking sublime. Yeah. Awesome. So, that's another one under our belt. One of five, not nine, this week. And, um, Colin, where can people find you? Should we do, should we not do that? Should we do a favorite thing? Colin. What is your favorite non domesticated animal? It's a good question. Because, I mean. Hmm. Actually, I'm going to change my mind. What is your favorite British wildlife animal? Badger. Badger. Good. Carl, what is your favourite non-domesticated British animal? Hedgehog. Good choice. I want to know why badger, Carl. I've just always liked badgers. They're cool. They're a bit goth. Nocturnal. (laughs) They're like, you know, hanging around in the woodlands, being all stripey. (laughs) And Carl, why did you choose hedgehog? I think remembering various road safety things as a kid. <laughs> <laughs> like little animated hedgehogs just like... If you're going to get run over, curl up into exactly. a ball. It's something I still use to this day. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and for me, it is, it's fox, right? And the reason I like foxes so much is they look like a dog, but they move like a cat. 
and that is the best combo. <laughs> I love dogs and I love cats. And foxes have got a nice face. They're ginger and they're like a dog cat. The best. Yeah, I can dig yeah. that. So with that revelation, thank you very much for joining us for another episode. Another ridiculous episode. Of the Animals of Farthing Wood podcast. That too. And until next time. (laughs) What noise does a badger make? That's probably not it, but it'll do. Oh dear. Shipwrecked and Comatose, a Red Dwarf podcast, was created and produced by Mark Adams and Kurt North. You can find us on Twitter at Red Dwarf Pod, and we are part of the We Made This Podcast Network. Hi, I'm Colin. I'm Ian. And I'm Tracy. And we dig music. Just not always the same music. Each episode, we pick our 10 favourite songs from a specific year, rate them, and then battle it out over a top 30 countdown. Colin's pretty enthusiastic about most stuff, Ian less so. And Tracy definitely owns a thesaurus. And one of us will regularly be told to f**k off. <laughs> so join us each month to hear what we dig and what we don't. Listen to We Dig Music wherever you get your podcasts. Find us on WeDigPodcast.com or we're on the We Made This Podcast Network, which you can find at WeMadeThisNetwork.com.